can raise your hand at any time. Okay, if apparently not. Nobody has a question. You're all very shy. Come um, on, ask some goddamn questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sit there, there stiff. Spencer, what, what? Go ahead. Um, so back, back uh, with all the musicians that were playing, was there uh, any special relationships between the dancers and musicians? I that, imagine there was. It wasn't supposed to be. Remember, no fraternizing. <laughs> intellectual ways. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But you see, if you don't have a rule, it would run amok. Uh, it was understood, no fraternizing. But what I used to remember seeing, the guys, the musicians would go downstairs at the end of the night, there was a bar on the corner. So naturally the guy would be in the bar. Then here come, the girls would be sort of sauntering, and then all of a sudden you see a couple go in one direction. But it was frowned on because of the intimacy of working every night. And uh, it runs into troubles when there's an intimate relationship because more than likely there's a wife somewhere and then she comes into the ballroom and, and you know, you, you're involved with bullshit that just don't mean nothing. And that's the reason why, uh, but the relationship between chorus girls and musicians are, fa are famous because it naturally happens. I mean, there's a girl dancing in front of a guy and sweetie, boy meets girl, and that's how it happens. What about collaborations? Did they ever, um, did musicians and dancers work together to have the musicians write a piece that the dancers said? Typically, uh, Jimmy Lunswood wrote for Dancers Only. He wrote that for the chorus girls. Because it was, uh, you, have you, you've heard for Dancers Only. That was written by Jimmy Lunsford for the Apollo Chorus. The dance tonight is put by a group that calls themselves for Dancers Only. There's a group tonight? Yeah, well, no, the, this venue that we're in, this is where they dance every other week. This is our shirt. Oh. This is for Dancers Only. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And we play the song every night. It's, it's a groovy number, but that's what the chorus girls at the Apollo Theater, they, that was their number, yeah. So that was put together exclusively for Dancers Only. Oh, yes. For the, but, well, see, the Apollo chorus girls had to have different routines. They work uh, 52 weeks a year. A band comes in every week. Now, every week, uh, th the dancers had to put together dance routines to fit the band. And uh, now you figure, if you got to work every week, one week is Charlie Barnett, one week is uh, Duke Ellington, one week is Louis Prima. I mean, now uh, every band who comes in, there's routines got to fit that band. That's what the chorus girls in Harlem used to do. They were so perfect. They're the ones that created jazz dancing because they had to make up the routines to fit the bands. And that's where jazz dancing started with the chorus girls, the black chorus girls in Harlem. Yeah. One more question along those lines that someone passed me under the table before the session. Um, what, what's dance, yeah, it, no, it's not that salacious. Um, <laughs> What famous musicians that we might have known of um, also danced? I know Ella Fitzgerald was a Lindy Hopper, but who else? For dancers? Yeah, at the Savoy. I know some well, of the musicians danced. Ella was danced the only singer that could dance. She was just a good, she, Ella was just a natural dancer. So uh, uh, even Fra Frankie used to dance with Ella a lot of times. Uh, the other girls, like uh, Savannah Churchill played the Savoy. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, Different bands came in, uh, but Ella was the most popular. Billy came in with Count Basie. Billy couldn't couldn't move a step. She all she could do when she did was this hand. That's, that's all. The, I don't think Billy could ever move. Did she ever move at all? And, but she was so good. She just would sit there and rock. But see, most of the time Billy was high. <laughs> I mean, you know, she she was in a world all her own, and she was always high. You know, so that's why. Baby, you know, that's why that, that type of thing comes. She was wonderful. Don't misunderstand. Some people love getting high. And <laughs> Billy, unfortunately, was one of those ladies. Uh, we adored her, but uh, that was what she loved. Uh, she could drink a quart of gin before the night was over. And she always carried a little chihuahua with her and put an a ashtray on the bar and filled it with gin and her and the, <laughs> the chihuahua be drunk as hell. <laughs> oh, we loved her, but she, she was a victim of her own pleasures. 
I mean, here was a woman, you, you get a, any kind of talent that don't have to work for it, you bet your bottom dollar, they, gonna, they go off the deep end because they don't have to strive. She could get, get up in the morning and say, she worked with the greatest musicians in the world. They never even had to take a second take. She come in, they play the chorus, she sang a chorus, it's it. She didn't have to struggle to sing. Some people have to struggle with the talent, so they don't have the time and the luxury to delve into the pleasures of the, of the body. That's all Billy did. She liked getting high. And it was a sad thing, but it was a wonderful to listen to. Uh, she was a joy. We used to look at Billy, I mean, the last time she was playing a joint in Milwaukee and she's in the bathroom changing her clothes. I said, B, what the hell are you doing here in the bathroom changing your clothes? She didn't give a goddamn. You know, she was that kind of a person, but you adored her. And that's what made her singing so special. But she was a victim of something she loved. And we love things sometimes is the most devastating thing for us. That's what, but that's what, it, that's what being human is. She was the most human person I know. I don't know nobody was more human than Billy. She didn't give a damn. <laughs> and that's why she died at 42, you know. Very sad, but she was, boy, could she sing. She could get to you in your heart. That's what, uh, uh, living for you, you know, it's easy living. And the way she would phrase, I mean, you think she's, Billy made all the pimps go back to their wives. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm telling you, she was, she was amazing. She was amazing. But she had her place in the world. It wasn't for longevity at all. It couldn't have been, you couldn't live through what Billy lived through at all, you know? It's uh, like me, I'm a coward. I'm gonna live forever. I'm just scared of all this. <laughs> well, shut up. <laughs> all right. Do, do we have, um, I'll check in quickly. Do we have any other questions? If not, I'll, I'll, um, I want to bug Jazz a little bit. Okay. Uh, Norma, can you give Jazz the microphone? Oh, good. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I know you were in the Cotton Club, the movie. Yes. And I would kind of like to hear how you got involved in that, um, because if I remember correctly, that was an interesting story. Well, yes, it was, because I remember like it was yesterday, and what a day was yesterday. Anyway, um, uh, Norma called me and told me she was going by to uh, have lunch with the cast of the Cotton Club. And would I like to go? So I said, yes, I wasn't doing anything. So I, I, we went to, I went to Astoria and I met Norma and they were having lunch and I knew all of the tap dancers that were, were oh. there. Uh, but when, when was this? For what year was that? 84, 1984, with Richard Gere, any of you seen it? No, that's before your time. You saw it? One person saw it, okay, that's good. Uh, anyway, it, um, so I got there and I said, I, I, I said hello to a lot of dancers, but then comes, walks in Gregory Hines, and he spots me, he comes over with, hey, Jazz, how you doing? What are you doing? I said, oh, I'll get here and there. Would you like to be in the movie? I said, hell yeah. <laughs> he took me to the back room and, and, and had them sign me up. Just like that, because I've known Gregory Hines for years. We watched them grow up, the Hines brothers. And um, it was very interesting, because like I said, I knew most everybody, all the tap dancers. And it was like, for me, with just that one scene, but I was very, very happy to be in that one scene. And I also was very happy to have that little spot that, that, that they gave me because a lot of the dancers, they, they cut it out. So I was very fortunate to be seen. It's short, you can't blink your eye, you, you'll miss it. But I, I'm still very happy to, to have been in that movie. I, I also had a question for, for Chester along the same lines. Since you, you've all done actually a lot of film work, um, I don't know if you know that, that 
you Norma actually won an Emmy for. No, I was nominated. Oh, you were nominated. For, well, she um, should have won an Emmy. Stopping at this award. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Chester has done. Have you been nominated for anything? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't win either, but I was nominated. Yeah, that's better than nothing. Right. But, but you've worked with uh, Steven Seagal and a bunch of other action stars, and uh, I mean Michael Jackson for video clips, and uh, I don't even know what to ask. Is how did Bugs Bunny? How did you get to work with Michael Jackson? I well, I, like I said, I worked for Michael. Um, Is it on? Oh. <laughs> no, I want to clear the house. <laughs> no, that. Um, I was like I said, I was did music videos in the '80s was the biggest craze at that time for everybody. If you were a choreographer, uh, your work was shown all over the world. And I was doing uh, working for a company called Imaginary Entertainment at that time, and I got this job from 20th Century Fox. And they needed a choreographer to do Johnny Dangerously with Michael Keaton, and the guy that did the music was Weird Al Yankovic, and so that's how I met him. And then he said they needed a choreographer. We need somebody to to choreograph him, so he did, I taught him how to dance, I came in and taught the whole crew, the whole set, there was a Roy 20 scene, and I taught it in the 60 minutes. <laughs> and the, guy, the cameraman director walked in and said, oh my God, he said, <laughs> okay, right. uh, no joke. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so so uh, they, they said, wow, we got everybody dancing, so they had to reshoot it, and right then I was hired to work with the company, uh, then that, then my name got across to this guy choreographing all these people. And then uh, Michael Jackson was doing this thing right there. I was like, oh wow, he's doing a whole bunch of this album came out. And he was doing this fantasy thing. By the time I come on, it was it was off the bandwagon. If you saw the bandwagon earlier today, it was the um, Smooth Criminal. And it was with the other uh, choreographers did it. And I was like continuity person and to do this special. There's a scene, the scene where you see him grab the uh, pool ball and crush it and blows it in the guy's face and he flips the guy over and the guy dissolves it. I did the stuff like that. I got a chance to work with him. That was the first time I got a chance to work with him. On that, the second I did some of his work on his tour. Meanwhile, they asked me to come in and do a parody on some of his uh, things. We did bad. How many scenes? I'm fat. <laughs> okay, as a parody on. Um, uh, well, uh, it's <laughs> Weird Al is fat. I'm fat. I said I'm bad. I'm bad. I'm fat. And so, <laughs> and so that got me a name to do a television, and then it went all over. I started doing MC Hammer, Voice Men, Soul to Soul, The Commodore. Some of these groups you probably don't know. I worked with a lot. Huh? Oh, you do. I'm just really let. I'm just let you know. This is when we were working with albums or records. <laughs> Some of you don't know what a record is. Yeah. You know what a CD is. A CD is a black record. Play on laser, okay? <laughs> so I'm just letting you know. So the name, my name started carrying on. So I did all the, in the 80s, I did the NAACP Image Awards for six years. I did the Soul of American Music eight years. I did the Stella Awards, which is the uh, Oscars for gospel music. Um, God, how many Broadway's I worked with? Tony Babyface, Tony Braxton, Della Reese, uh, Lyle Hampton, uh, Barry Gordy, Dick Clark. You had a, uh, El, um, uh, Elliot had a, 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 a poster of you. Oh. Uh, the poster with you in the white suit, like Michael Jackson. Oh, what was that? That was when I uh, did my world tour with my own company. I had a company called BBJ, Black Ballet Jazz. The first company that did vernacular jazz all the way. We, we toured 15 years. That poster was done in Russia. That was me dancing in Russia. And it was at, uh, dressed in white. They caught me in the air doing a turn in the air. They took a picture of it. And the next day it was on the papers. Oh, wait, but can you show them that poster? I don't know. Don't, don't have it on, on, your, on your TV? Thing? Oh, no, I don't have it on TV. Oh. I don't have that one. It's a poster. And, you know, Michael Jackson in the white suit, you know, the yeah. thing that Michael Jackson. He has a poster, but I thought it was Michael Jackson, and it was was him in the in the white suit. Uh, uh, and Elliot showed us the poster when we were getting ready to go to Rio. Oh, yeah. Remember? 
That was it. Oh, right. Now, why haven't I, why haven't we seen the poster? Anymore? There's a lot of posters I would see. There's oh, one I would be in, in me and Lena Horn. You got one with Lena Horn? Lena Horn. I'm jumping over a car, doing the split. Flying really? down on Hollywood Boulevard. Oh, okay, okay. I'm I'm not not I'm not I'm not Listen, I, he does so many things. I really, you know, I have something because I think everybody know how, but I think of, of Chester. I think it's brilliant. That's why I call him Cecil B. DeMille. He's brilliant, and I'm hoping that this show he's getting ready to do in New York, people will really see it because he's doing the producing the show at the Apollo Theater for Frankie Manning thing. So it's going to be his choreography. So. You get a chance to see some of his work, especially in New York and Harlem, and he better come, he better have his together, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, this, this, uh, that opened doors for me. I worked uh, in the right. 80s with, uh, you know, you know, Chuck Norris. Then worked with him. I was a stuntman for two years and a half. My mom told me, stop that, though. <laughs> I'd rather you dance than do stunt work. Yes, I was in a movie called Octagon. If you ever seen that movie Octagon, I was a, I was an assassin in that movie. <laughs> I died four times, <laughs> not one, four. And uh, huh? That's a good assassin. Yeah, it was good. Well, they they said they needed some some stunt guys, and Chuck Norris came in and said, "You you you can you come?" I said, "Sure, we can do it." And I had a group of us, and the first one we did, Lee Van Cleef, shot me off the Brickmore Hotel, four stories, and I fell off the building. Oh. Went out and uh, he said, bam, and I got, ah, bam, into the airbag. I said, that was cool. I, just, I said, well, I'm tired. As soon as I got home that night, I said, well, Chuck wants you to come back the next day and do this other scene. I said, well, I'm already dead. <laughs> <laughs> you got to come back and do it. Uh, is Chuck Berry? He's Chuck talking? Norris. Oh, Chuck <laughs> Norris. Uh -huh. The talking like that. And then Berry? Chuck Berry. No, he couldn't do that. I don't think Chuck Berry. Chuck, I know. Chuck Berry. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, so I got, I got stabbed by a sword. I was a ninja, and stabbed by a sword. And the last scene, I had to fight Chuck in a hotel with me and my, my clan of ninjas. And he beats, of course, he beats me up. In rehearsal, there's a scene, he's like, you gotta grab Chuck. And I had a wire, and I wrap around his throat. I'm gonna choke him, and he flips me over, and he kicks me through a glass plate and through the door. And in rehearsals, he goes, I said, okay, ready, rehearsal. And I go, I'm choking him, and he goes, <clears throat> Chester, you're not, you're not going. I said, somebody take a picture. I'm seizing the moment. I'm choking Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I gotta take advantage of that while I, while I, while I can. <laughs> so that got me into the, the television thing. The movie TV series Night Stalker, you know, Daryl McGavin. Yeah, Night Stalker, I've done that. I've mean, seen um, Batman Forever. I done that. I just seen you know, the helicopter. I did that. Brought the helicopter down. Explosion. And I did the uh, Blade, the movie Blade, the second Blade with the what? With Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes. Blade. Oh, Blade. Uh huh. And the, she, the, the back. Before he went to jail. Yeah, he's out. He's out. <laughs> he's <laughs> before he went to jail. Oh, now. Oh. He's out now. It was a prison break. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> so I think. So. Did you have another question? I, I just had a question about the relationship between Tap and Lindy, and specifically the, the Lindy Hoppers. Were there some of them only did Lindy and looked down upon Tap, or was Tap something you had? To no, do? Tap dancers looked down on Lindy Hoppers. Uh, they called us all kinds of names. Uh, 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 well, uh, Tap dancing was the, the first art, and they sort of felt offensive because we came in, as he called us, a bunch of Bobby Sockers, mm -hmm. su 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 such a name. But they didn't like it because we, they thought that we did not upheld the image that the tap dancers had. We became friends, we, we compromised, because tap dancer was here, Lindy Hopper was here. But uh, the average Lindy Hopper just isn't a good dancer. <laughs> they can Lindy Hop. The problem with Lindy Hoppers, they don't know how to dance. Where the tap dancer had to learn how to dance. And that, believe me, uh, Chaz, you had the opportunity when, I, when Chats came with me, I gave him the best teachers in the world. He had Honey Coles, he had Charlie Atkins, he had Pete Nugent. They trained uh, Chaz, but he all, Chaz could also, Chaz learned how to do the Lindy. When he came with me, 
See, my dancers did not do the Lindy. My dancers was jazz dancers. That's why he fit. But jazz was able to bridge the two things. But as a rule, tap dancers was not very appreciative of Lindy Hoppers because they felt that we were cheaters. <laughs> and actually, Lindy Hoppin was cheating. It is, I mean, but when you, but you can interact Lindy with jazz. And that's why we try to teach dancers jazz dancing because you can Lindy, like you see people, they're doing air steps. And I kept saying, well, when the hell are they gonna start dancing? <laughs> they have neglected that one thing that connects it. That's right, they just don't know how to dance, yeah. And it's all, and see, they're so engrossed in Lindy, which is fine. But if you marriage the two, then you can learn what it means to swing. I, I watch dancers today. They dance, but they you left out the greatest thing. You can't swing. And dan jazz dancing helps you to swing. And I advise you, begin to learn jazz. And it doesn't interfere with the Lindy. You can put the two things together. You can do the walk we did and do the Lindy, right? It, stop in the middle of it and can, and can continue. You can't just do the Lindy. The Lindy is dull as dishwater. <laughs> now learn how to put that together then you'll have that combination of what make good jet, what good make good swing dancing. Like, which dancers would you recommend us watching to learn how to jump? I won't. I, I won't. T I won't say. That's something you have to conclude on your own. Like I said, I don't interfere with dancers because I, I tell you the truth, and most dancers don't want to hear the truth. I'm sorry. Uh, that's why I was suggested by. Uh, <laughs> some of the great dancers. Normal, you would. We would rather you not teach, <laughs> because I'm not good at that. If you look, if I look at you, and I'm gonna tell you what I think, that's not good for business. It's, you know, it's true. It's, 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 I was in your first class <laughs> <laughs> fifteen years ago. When, fifteen years ago, I, I get to tell a story. Fifteen years ago, we, we brought Norma to Stanford. Richard Powers and Ralph Van Harn, who was teaching here this weekend, Ralph. We brought Norma to Stanford. Now, correct me if this story is not exactly as I remember it. Your memory is better than mine. But they tricked you. They told you that you were going to come and just talk about history and right. give a lecture and show some movies. Right. And then at 10.30 in the morning, Rob Van Harn knocks on Norma's door and says, come on, your class is in 15 minutes. Let's go. And he walks her over to this dance studio where there were about 20 of us right. terrified. Some of us thought we were hot you know, potatoes. I thought so. Um, best dancers in college. And she tore us apart. Um, I mean, Rob was scared. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but we love you. He said, I, yeah. I, I frightened Diane to death. I can't tell I'm Diane. But, uh, I, you know, when you dance at a level, I'm, I, I expect that from a dancer because I, I produce dancing. I have to come in and I got an hour. You take an hour to do walk, all right, rotate, and you never get through an hour with one step. In, in an hour, I want a routine. Yeah. And that means I come in, I said, give me four, give me, uh, give me two swing outs, give me a reverse, now we take a break here. And, and if I talk like that, you don't understand me. And a dancer has to understand me. I haven't got, I, I haven't got the time to teach. You've been, you learn from teachers, and when you finish with the teachers, then you're ready. Like I said, if you're gonna get ready to do a Broadway show, you have to audition. And whoever the choreographer is, you have got to do what he's asking. And only the person who has been trained well can do that in any ballet company, any modern company, and in jazz. It's neglected in Lindy because you've not been exposed to be in the professional that will be prepared to go on the stage with it. What you're doing in the classroom will not put you on the stage. That's why they don't hire Lindy Hoppers. You, everything, it, everybody gets hired, but when, when, when have you seen a Lindy Hopper get a job? <laughs> well, well, why haven't you gotten a job? That means at uh, the red flag's up, you ain't good enough. And you gotta face that fact. If you're going to be a dancer, if you're gonna be a social dancer, that's fine, but that doesn't matter. 
But if you're gonna go beyond that, you gotta lift the bar. And the bar is really rough on a dancer. It's as simple as that. Right, dude? Right, Jessica? Okay, all right. He's gonna be auditioning dancers for the Apollo. What's he gonna do? He's gonna come in there with ordinary dancers at the Apollo? They better Megan. have it together. Okay, all right. Oh. I think Megan has a question. I just wanted to share, you had choreographed a routine that we just called Norma's. That's all we call it for Rob and Diane, their swing cats group. And oh. it, it, down by, uh, Swing by the Sea in Monterey, years ago. Really? You had taught them choreography, and three years later you were back, and you were in the background, and you performed it. Like three years later, she oh. remembered the routine, so we have a video of like people performing, and Norma's in the back, she's like, oh. It's <laughs> um, a little sense. Yeah, I was just like, it's still called Norma's. And the You're outfit, kidding. It is like the shortest mini skirts and like a tuxedo. With yes. Backless, arms cut off. But it is. Wow. Yeah. No, did, did I help you? I wasn't there. I but mean, I mean, I but did I help there. them? Yes, of course. You, you choreographed did, the whole thing. I, I meant, uh, <laughs> did I help it? I mean, <laughs> wonderful. But you know, every, I have a, a routine that. Chaz and them, uh, I create, I, I choreographed the number, and it was called Back Bay Shuffle? Yes. Right. Yes. Now, that's something that, it, they've been doing that number for 30 years, but it was Back Bay, that was the first routine I did. Remember, I left D Lindy Hoffman and dancing after the war. I, we had no partners, so uh, Whitey wanted me to take on secondary type of dances. I went to the Savoy, and what I saw was left you know, just was not appealing to me, so consequently, I went into another direction. But I was away from dancing almost 25 years. I didn't get back into dancing until I did that book, uh, Swinging at the Savoy, and uh, Larry Schultz sort of got me involved back again, and that's how, but I was away from dancing a long time because it wasn't feasible, we couldn't get work. When Frankie Manning and them couldn't get work, Frankie had to go into the post office for 37 years. And you, there was no work for dancers. So consequently, we all had to begin to do something else. And consequently, I went to comedy. And uh, I wrote the first book on comedy, The Encyclopedia of Black Humor. And you can get that on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, in the period when your father was at the post office, what did you do? Um, he was with I, was, the I was teaching, and I was with the Norma Miller dancers. Uh, in 1964, we went to Australia for eight weeks, and we came back, and there was no work in sight. Right. So everybody went their own different ways. I start driving a cab and, and working in the post office and uh, Frankie called me up and said, he was Frankie was in the post office he called me up and said look uh, they're giving out applications for uh, jobs in the post office why don't you come down and get one fill it out and uh, and see what happens so I, I, I got my application filled it out took the test and I drove a cab for a, a year and a half before I heard from them. <laughs> really? I was married and I had kids, so I had to work. And he, he got married early, but you know, he had babies. How's a dancer going to have babies? <laughs> Daddy. So, <laughs> as life turns. was around until, like, Frankie said, oh, you should. My son, right? Yeah, although he, when we were getting ready to do the first Norma Miller dances, and I was looking for, for, for young, young dancers, young teenagers, he said, well look, why don't you get, why don't you, let me, why don't you look at my son? And that was the first time, I was with Frankie 70 years. <laughs> I, we were together every day. How do you be with somebody every day and don't know they had a son? <laughs> I mean, where, where was he hiding it? <laughs> he was 17. And like, I got figured out, I told Norma, I said, Norma, the only reason why you didn't know Frankie had a son because he was waiting to see if I can really dance or not. <laughs> <laughs> and when he danced, 
I said, you Frankie Manning's son. He danced just like his dad. I remember those words. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, me and Frankie, we've been together all our lives. How do you keep a secret from somebody like, where the hell did he come from? <laughs> Chads, you're, yes. you're a secret at 16. Right. What is six, your, your 16th year to your 17th year? What's, what I, was, I was in a dancing school yeah. called Mary Bruce Dancing School on 125th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. And uh, they give recitals every year at Carnegie Hall, uh, different places like that. And Frankie did come down to catch the show. And so he's watching me. <laughs> you know, watching me through the years. So uh, 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 I started at Mary Booth when I was 12 years old, and at 17, uh, well, I I was teaching and doing things like that. And then Frankie said, "Norma needs some dances," and I was ready. I never heard a chant. <laughs> <laughs> but what's amazing? The Kenny dance? <laughs> I mean, see, the kids I had were just great jazz dancers. See, that's that's all we did was great jazz. That was the Norma Miller dance. That was a group I took to Australia. And we were in Australia for a whole year. They were so very good. But then uh, uh, the boys were the outstanding part. It was very expensive to travel with the, with the group. That was my problem. I had a lot of people to pay. And it was hard to, it was very hard on me. It, I just, I wasn't making no money. I'm paying it all out and you, transportation and blah, blah, blah. Then I decided I would take the boys out and let the girls go. Because now that became the jazz men because they were the ones doing the, 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 the great dancing. So out of that came the, the jazz men. And uh, well now, dancing is not lucrative. So out of that came me, Going, leaving all of that behind and going out to California, and that's where I joined Red Fox and began studying to be a comedian because Moms Mabley had died and Red wanted another woman comedian. So I used to be, hang with him different places and he would call me and put me out on stage and the few times I went out and I would <laughs> um, Now I have to learn how to make myself funny. And that became the writing period. I would sit in the back and would write a line. Because Red would say, write a line every day. At the end of seven days, you got a week, you have seven jokes. At the end of 30 days, you got 30 jokes and you wouldn't have to up with my act. And that was began how I began writing comedy. And I'm working with Richard Pryor, Red Fox, Bill Cosby, Flip Wilson. I'm in the bed of great comedy, and this is the breakthrough for black comedians coming out. Flip Wilson got the first, no, Bill Cosby got the first TV show. Flip Wilson got the next TV show. Red Fox got the next TV show. These, these guys are putting the, setting the world on fire, and I'm amongst them. And Red was the first comedian to go into a nightclub with five comedians. It was Slappy White, Pat Morito, you know, the Karate Kid, me, there was a Spanish boy, and Red Fox. We were the comedians to go into a nightclub. And I'm the one, I'm the only woman that I opened the, I, that was when I was doing my first stand-up. And that's where I learned how to be. Then, of course, we played Vegas. Now I'm into comedy. I'm not even thinking about no more damn dancing. <laughs> I'm gonna be this great comedian. And hence, a lot of shit crap happened to you. <laughs> can't believe, you can't believe the shit that happens to you on the way, but it's been a great experience. But the greatest thing was to watch Richard Pryor every night. I learned the meaning of master. He was a master. He would have us laying out on the floor. He was so funny. He was just so brilliant. And to, to see him work, he was he, nobody would hire Richard. And, you know, well, listen, the kind of material that, that they, they threw him out of there, <laughs> threw Richard out of Vegas. So Red said, keep the mic open. Anytime Richard Pryor wants the mic, give him the mic. So that was his place where he would come and practice all his 
his routines. That's why he did the great routine called the wino. Did you ever see Richard? No. That is a masterpiece. And, you, and, he, and to see that develop, and to see, uh, to see Bill Cosby come up behind Richard Pryor. Here was a man squeaky clean. These were masters in comedy, and I'm watching them every night. And I'm learning. God damn, I'm learning. Right? They try to put me down. I'd go back. And don't, I don't answer them. I write the answer. You black bastard done. <laughs> and that began the process of how to develop into comedy. And this was every night. And I, I loved those years. I loved, the only reason why I stopped doing uh, stand-up I have played the greatest houses in the world as a dancer. When I find myself in comedy, I'm playing sleazy joints. <laughs> Sleaze and me didn't go together. <laughs> I don't care. I, I said, not all the comedy world gonna have me. Here's the guy in rainy jeans and shit, walks on the stage in front of a mic, and they call that comedy. Oh, sweetie, I played some joints. I couldn't believe it. me who have played Radio City in the best houses in the world have come down to this for some goddamn comedy. <laughs> so I left that. I'd rather do the comedy of, of, of uh, I do stories. And I like to be elegant on the stage. I like an elegant audience. Because uh, the rat says out there, as an audience, you know what they say to you when you get on stage, you know? And I had to answer them. And I would answer them. I mean, I'll tell you just what Richard Pryor tell you. Uh -huh. Fuck you, God. <laughs> that ended up, you had to worry about it when you say that to somebody. And that's what you have, getting out to that, I, that wasn't my deal. So I said, look at that, y'all can have it. I don't want that shit no more. <laughs> anyway, that's, this is where I am today. An old bag still standing here with you guys. I don't know what the hell I'm doing here either. <laughs> it's just that I've lived a long time. Where's your truck? How did you get your longevity? Well, let me tell you something. It's best not to smoke. Don't drink. Don't fool around. You don't have to be a nun. You just got to live a nun's life. None of this, none of that. <laughs> So we're getting really close to the end. If there's one more question, maybe I'll take it. Um, otherwise, no. Um, you can come up and um, You'll get buy my yeah, buy DVDs, get them autographed, okay. or if you brought books, you can get them autographed. Uh, by the way, you should buy the DVD if you haven't seen the comedy stuff because it has some of the clips with Norma and Richard Fryer and on Sanford and Son. Yeah. Um, so. Anyway, uh, please help me thank Mr. Chaz Young, Mr. Chester Whitmore, and Ms. Norma Miller.